So uh, let's uh, wrap up the LC circuit. We are going to um, write out the, the, the Kirchhoff's uh, loop rule equation and see what the solution to that uh, circuit looks like. As a reminder, this is what LC circuit looks like. We are trying to deal with as simple a circuit as possible. So we are not going to have any voltage sources. We are going to simply have a capacitor hooked up to an inductor. And I did build a, uh, so this is the circuit I was using for demonstration last time. Uh, inductor hooked up to capacitor. That's it. Um, you will be dealing with this in lab. So, now, if, we simply, if it's simply like this, it will be very boring. Nothing interesting would happen. So you have to charge it up. You have to give it some initial condition so that something interesting happens. So you have to give it some initial condition at time equals 0 so that something interesting happens at future times after time equals 0. So let's say at time equals 0, I charge up the capacitor so that I have plus Q0 and minus Q0 on, on these two sides of the capacitor. And let I guess we ha do have to give this condition. Let's say at time equals 0 is the moment we close the switch. So the current that's uh, going through this circuit at time equals 0 is equal to 0. Because um, before we close the switch, current is 0 because it's uh, um, it's an open circuit. And the moment we close the switch, what's preventing the current from suddenly changing from 0 to a non-zero value um, instantaneously? Like which circuit element prevents that from happening? The inductor, right? The, remember the properties of this circuit element. I probably should write it on the. Uh, left hand side here. So the with so with the register, the property is that change in voltage across the register is IR. With the inductor, the property is that change of voltage across inductor is the inductance times rate of change of current. So what the inductor does is it opposes the change of current. And what uh, with the capacitor the property you have is, um, I'm, this is the definition of capacitance. I'm just writing it slightly differently. Voltage across the capacitor is equal to Q over C, I think. Yes, Q over C. <laughs> so and we are going to be using this over and over today as we go through this time dependent and AC circuit. So this is the circuit. That's our initial condition. And we are going to be using this at some point to analyze this circuit. Yeah. So when you are trying to analyze a circuit that you haven't seen before, what, uh, where do you start? Like what's the general purpose tool that you have that will let you analyze any circuit that you see for the first time? Yeah, Kirchhoff's rules. So there's the loop rule and junction rule. And with the DC circuit, you know, we use the both set of rules because DC circuit is a simple, so we can make the circuit more complicated. As we are dealing with this time-dependent circuit, um, because there's only a finite amount of time in the world, <laughs> in class and during the exam, um, so I'm going to give you a simpler circuit. Um, so, no more, so most of the time, you won't have to use the junction rule because it's such a simple circuit that you have only one loop uh, and no junctions. But you should use the loop rule. So the, imagine this is my loop. So this is going to give me my loop rule equation. And using the Kirchhoff's loop rule, we can say that sum of all the voltage changes across the loop or around the loop is equal to zero. And, um, and you know, so, yeah. So let's apply this. Uh, this will continue to hold true for all the circuits that we are analyzing. So let's write out all the changes of voltage as we go around this loop. So I specified my 
initial charge this way, so I will define my sense of direction in a way to consistent with this. So as I go across the capacitor, do I gain or lose voltage? Gain voltage, right? I'm going from negative to positive plate. So, and amount I gain is here. So as I go across the capacitor, I'll gain plus, and I'm going to write charge as a function of time. So, you know, at time equals zero, it's Q naught, but um, I'm, so I want to use this equation to set up a differential equation that I'm going to solve like I solved it for RC and LR circuit. So it's going to be plus charge as a function of time divided by C, the capacitance. It has to be given to you somehow. And all right, so that's the first element. The, so this is close to its wire. As I go across the inductor, do I gain or lose voltage? You better lose voltage so that you come back to zero, right? So let me write this out this way. Minus L di dt. So that's the voltage change across the inductor. And I put this minus sign here so that um, it's a reminder to me um, that I'm supposed to be losing voltage as I go across this inductor, um, inductor of inductance L. So all of that done, it should add up to zero. That's a Kirchhoff's loop rule. So, all right, so I have one equation here. Now, do I have enough information to actually solve this? How many unknowns do I have? I have two. I don't know the charge as a function of time. That's what I'm trying to find. That's what I'm interested in. I know the charge at time equals zero, but, uh, but I want to know what the charge is at some later point in time. And I also don't know the current as a function of time. So there's two unknowns, which means I need at least one more expression. And where do I get that? Yeah, current through the capacitor. That's a given as the current through the capacitor is given as the rate of change of the amount of charge on the capacitor. Because whatever current comes out is the charge that's on here that's flowing out, or whatever current goes in will accumulate as charge on the capacitor. Right? Now, this is the step, as we did last time on last Wednesday, where we have to be careful with the sign. And really, this is what all this comes down to. All these choices that I've made um, along the process here, all these positive signs I've written down, this minus sign I've written down, all those come down to a uh, choice of uh, uh, direction of pos choice on the positive direction that I've made those choices. And all I have to do is make sure that however I choose my sign here, plus or minus, that this choice is consistent with these choices that have already been made. So actually here, I made it sound like this. this has to be positive, this has to be negative. They don't have to be. It could have been negative and positive. Um, and uh, you, the loop that you have to close is where you choose the correct sign here. So by the choices you have made here, you are constrained into whatever sign that you pick here. So this is where I have to imagine this. So this is the initial condition I've set up. As this charge flows out, I'm going to say this is my positive direction of current. So my current is increasing, right? Increasing from zero to some positive value. So my di dt is positive, and all of that makes sense. That's why I needed a minus sign here, so that the voltage would drop across the inductor. Now, for that picture there, where charge flows out and positive current flows, do I need a plus sign here or a minus sign here? What is the sign of my dq dt? dq dt is negative. It's decreasing. Current, I want it to be positive. So here, I need to pick the negative sign so that minus times minus works out to be positive. So this is the exercise that you have to go through every single time. Uh, I, at least I do that every single time. Um, you could memorize a set of rules that would just uh, have you picking the correct sign each time, but I think this is simpler. To um, have, take a snapshot that you are given, the initial condition, 
and make sure the choice of sign you make here is the consistent with everything that you have done so far. Question? So I'm looking at looking at uh, I'm looking at around the time equals zero. That makes it easier to visualize this. I know at time equals zero, I start out with the capacitor charged, and intuitively I know this starts to discharge, meaning the amount of charge decreases. So when amount of charge decreases, the rate of change is negative. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, OK, so I have two equations, two unknowns. So I mean, this is not algebra, but <laughs> intuitively, I probably should be able to solve this. So let me actually plug this in here and you know, do the same thing that we were doing before. Before, what we were doing was you know, we had this equation. We brought in the second equation. And we plug it in the expression for current and got some differential equation that we solved. Right? That's what we did for RC and LR circuits. So let's do that. Um, plugging in this to, or plugging in i into here, this is the equation I end up with. Q as a function of time, so I'm going to get a single equation in terms of a single unknown, Q, of t over c uh, minus, or minus times minus, so plus L times one time derivative, and on top of that, another time derivative acting on it. So second time derivative of Q as a function of time is equal to 0. All right. Um, let's do the same thing that we are doing with differential equations so far. With the differential equations, what we have been doing was we take the highest order derivative we see and we solve for it. That gives us um, some kind of standard form that we can uh, use as a starting point when we are trying to use our solution techniques. So solve this for my second order derivative. Then I get this. Second derivative of Q is equal to, move this over, so minus Q of T, and divide out L. So minus 1 over LC times Q of T. How many here have solved the second order differential equations before? How many here, is it math 3E or 3F? I keep for, uh, switching those numbers around. 3F is the differential equations. How many here have taken math 3F? Some of you. <laughs> so actually, if we, in 3B and 3C, you will not have seen a solution to this yet. Um, can you use separation of variables to solve this? Not really. Like, how would you separate? Like, you know, if you, I mean, as a physicist, I'm usually okay with the abusing notations, but even with that physicist standard, if I write down something like this, it's uh, kind of a nonsense. If I write down something like this, you know, this is what we would do if you are trying to do separation of variables. I have no idea what this dt squared means. I have no idea what this d squared q means. So, you know, as a physicist, I'm okay with abusing some notation, but there's a limit, and this is my limit, because uh, differentials make a sense when it's uh, just a sort of single order differential. When it was dq dt, I could do that. I could imagine that dq dt was really delta q over delta t and separated it out that way. But when it's a second order differential, it, um, doing that really, because you know, with the second order derivative, really what it's trying to say is this. And it gets more complicated. And what I'll tell you is that there is a solution technique that you will learn in math 3 e and, or 3F, whatever class is the differential equations. And um, that is beyond the level of math required for this class. So how are we going to solve this? I mean, this class does cover LC circuits. It is one of the standard topics. I mean, I do spend more time on circuits than many other physics instructors do because I love circuits. But it is a set of standard topics. It's not something exotic that I'm bringing in from upper division level. It's something that we should be able to do. So given that we don't have the tools, how, how are we going to do it?
Yeah, you said guess, right? Yeah, we are going to guess. Nothing stops us from guessing a solution. And so we don't have um, proper formal mathematical tools to actually, you know, in a systematic way, get a solution to this, but we don't need it. We can simply guess a solution and check it. So, in fact, we actually did that in Math 4A. Um, uh, math 4A, Physics 4A. When we did oscillations, we actually got an equation of motion that looked awfully similar to this. And we got a solution to it and you knew even less math back then. So, um, so, so we are going to use the exact same approach. This, this is the thing about differential equations. Um, if you are trying to go from the equation to get a solution, that's usually a difficult step. It comes down to integration is more difficult than derivative. But once you have a solution, it's really easy to check because all you have to do is take the derivatives. So uh, I guess the only thing that you are missing out on when you do it that way is, um, in math class, I guess they um, spend a lot of time on like a uniqueness of a solution or like have you found all the solutions, that sort of stuff, right? So we're gonna miss out on that, but we have some sort of intuition that you know it's second order. If we find the two solutions, then we think that's gonna cover everything. So, so we're going to guess a solution to this. So this is where having some mathematical intuition is helpful because, um, I mean, you know, we can just start guessing randomly. Is my Q of t um, equal to t, or you know, it's, is it proportional t? Or is it you know t squared, or is it t to the third? Like we can just uh, start guessing random functions, but uh, that's not going to be very efficient, right? We have to make educated guess. So um, as you look at this uh, differential equation, you should have some sense of. I mean, you know, if you're referring back to physics for a, that's fine. But for those of you who don't remember what we covered in oscillations, you have to sort of look at some properties of the function q that's evident from this differential equation that this function must satisfy. So what are some properties of the function q as a function of time that's going to satisfy this equation? Anything you see in this equation where this must be true about this function q of t? Well, actually it can be zero because the double time derivative of zero is zero and zero is equal to minus one over LC times zero. That's what we, what's called the trivial solution in math. So we know that's a solution, so we're gonna just stay away from that. I mean, it's a solution, but it's an uninteresting solution. Okay, so let's uh, think of a function that's not zero and still an answer to this. Can it be a constant function? No, right? If it's constant non-zero function, then this is not zero, but your left-hand side becomes zero. So that doesn't work. Can it be a, like a linear function? Like Q of T is proportional to T. Why not? Yeah, you get constant. and. Yeah, so you take another derivative, so you get zero, and that's not equal to whatever function you started out with. In fact, here's something that we are seeing constrains us. As we take two derivatives twice, somehow we come back to the same function. So can this function be a polynomial function, if that's, this is true? Can it, I mean, Q of t, can it be any finite polynomial function? Like if it's a fourth order polynomial. It doesn't work, right? Right hand side is a fourth order polynomial, but after you take two derivatives, you are going to get second order polynomial, which cannot be equal to fourth order polynomial. So this is the most uh, distinguishing feature of this function Q of t, that after you have taken two derivatives, somehow the function that you get back is going to be proportional to Q of t. So let me write it down this way. Two derivatives, um, uh, actually, let me use the Newtonian uh, notation. I think it's Newtonian notation. Um, Q double prime is proportional to Q. When you have taken two 
derivatives that it's uh, proportional to the original function before you took any derivative. Yeah? Any functions that you know that satisfies this property? You must have seen some functions that's not polynomial function, so it must be some kind of special function that actually satisfies this. That when you take, as you take derivatives, the function doesn't change much. Yes, Chris? Yeah, exponential is one of them. So this could be satisfied by uh, something that looks like exponential of t. Now, uh, when as you consider this, so I mean, one of the things that might motivate this case is that you have been seeing exponentials so far in the circuit. But you run into a little bit of difficulty that you didn't have last time. So let me actually I'll get a proper, um, actually write it down. Um, so write down a proper form that has all the necessary constant in it. So Q of t, so it's going to have general form of exponential of t. Oops, exponential of t. And oh, let me write it this way. And um, it needs a couple constants to make the units come out right. So let me write in those two constants that have to be there to come out to make the units come out right. The exponential function itself gives a unitless quantity, so you need a constant here so that you have unit of charge. Exponential takes as input unitless number, so you must have another constant here that's going to be uh, canceling out unit of time so that you have a unitless number here. Now. Imagine, or do plug this into here. So you are going to take two time derivatives. When you take two time derivatives, this is what you end up with. Q double prime is equal to, each time derivative leaves the outside the function alone because it's exponential. And you use the chain rule, take the derivative of the inside, you get a factor of B out. So you get, so first the derivative takes out one factor of B, Second derivative takes out another factor of b, so you get b squared times a exponential of bt. And you recognize this as your original function, that's what you're going for. Say that this q double prime is equal to b squared times q. And you compare this result to the differential equation that you're trying to solve for, really guess on solution to. And do you see anything that's potentially problematic here? So let me finish the last step, you know, plug this in here. So what we are trying to say is that b squared q is equal to minus 1 over lc times q. And L, L, uh, q cancels out. So it looks like we are imposing some kind of condition on this parameter b. And the condition is that b squared is equal to minus 1 over, uh, minus one over lc. Is that a condition that can be satisfied? How do you satisfy this condition? What value should b be? I mean, if I write down, so if I write down b is equal to square root of minus 1 over lc, anybody got any issues with that? Are we using imaginary numbers? Or? So if we are using imaginary numbers, yes, we will have an answer for b. But um, in fact, that's what we are going to uh, spend most of our time today. Um, so this is, by the way, something I am doing that actually is not sta in the standard curriculum. Uh, I started, I tried this last semester, it worked out pretty okay. I'm going to introduce complex exponentials in this class because a lot of this math that we do with uh, AC circuit becomes a lot simpler once you know how to work with the complex exponentials. But how many here have seen complex exponentials outside of the trigonometry class where you should have seen it for the first time? in De Moivre's theorem. How many here remember De Moivre's theorem? About the nth root of a complex number. Nobody here remembers that? That's in pre-calculus. Like, never mind. Um, so yes, if we 
Allah be to be complex, as in Allah to be imaginary, then sure, we can do that. But right now, let's stick to real number so that we can at least get an answer here that's within our mathematical toolbox. So this is really going to be a limiting factor that it's right for, for the time being. It's not going to be in a little bit, but for the time being, if you are insisting that our B is in the set of real numbers, then this is not possible because L is positive, C is positive, so this is negative number, square root of negative number, that doesn't exist within real numbers. So this doesn't work. And that's really why this guess, for the time being, doesn't work. We're going to revisit this, and complex exponential will actually um, become one of the best guesses for many different circuits uh, in a little bit. But for now, because we are limiting ourselves to be being within the real set of real numbers, all this line of reasoning gets stopped by the fact that this coefficient here is negative. So uh, let's actually write it down as one more property of Q of T that we have to take into account. The property of Q of T is that when you take the double derivative, it's not that it's just proportional to Q, it's actually proportional to minus Q. And this minus sign actually matters because it limits uh, what forms of solution you can take. So let's uh, go back to generating guesses again. What functions do you know where after you take the double derivative? So we are not really looking for a function that doesn't change like exponential. We are looking for a function that does change, but changes in a way that there's this minus sign that gets introduced. I mean, you don't know that many, uh, you don't know that many special functions. You guess the exponential. What other special functions do you know? You know logarithm. Now, logarithm, does it feel like logarithm would work here? No, single derivative will give you one over Q, and then the next derivative will, oh, you get a minus sign. Minus one over Q squared, but okay, that's not logarithm, so that doesn't work. Okay, you've guessed the exponential logarithm. What other special functions do you know? Like, you're literally down to your last three or depending on how you count the last six uh, special functions. Unless you've, anybody here have heard of hyperbolic functions? Yeah, normally you learn about hyperbolic functions after you learn about complex exponentials, so that wouldn't be in your toolbox. Really, everyone here knows only exponential and logarithm? You could not have taken calculus without knowing a few more special functions. Uh, trigonometric. Yeah, trigonometric functions. That's the last class of transcendental or non, um, you know, non polynomial functions. So I, I guess maybe what you're thinking was, you know, if you have sine and cosine, when you take the derivative, they change. That's maybe why you weren't, your thought was going that way, but. What you have to, so this might have been escaping your notice, and this is actually an important part. We are not taking a first order derivative. We are taking second order derivative. We are taking two derivatives, and that's going to change. Um, that's going to matter. So let's say, um, so we can have two different guesses. We could say our Q as a function of time is equal to uh, proportional to cosine. So we could say it's cosine, of, uh, let me just put in all the proper um, uh, coefficients now. So we do say to some coefficient a times cosine of, and I kind of remember the um, coefficient I was using here before, angular frequency. So let me just use omega here so that I don't unnecessarily write down, you know, um, so that I limit the number of symbols I introduce. That's one um, form of a solution I could have. And since cosine and sine are kind of in the same category, let's try them out both together at the same time. Q, the second, solu second form of the solution would take the form of sine. And I need a different set of uh, coefficients to um, so this one will be B times the sine of, and I'm just gonna 
um, go with the gut feeling that it will be the same omega. So I'll just use the same symbol omega here. So let's uh, try plugging these in and see if there are solutions. And you will see that when you take a double derivative, that's where this will actually work out. So if, yeah, yeah, so, so let's um, do that here. So take the, actually, we don't need this anymore, right? So let me erase this and save some space. So. So uh, let's take the first guess. So um, to plug this in, we need, um, we need the first derivative of q of t. So first derivative of our first guess is going to be a times derivative of cosine is minus a sine. Minus sine, um, so derivative of the inside, so a factor of omega comes out. So it becomes minus omega a sine of omega t. And this is what most of you are thinking when you weren't suggesting that trigonometric function might work. Let's take another derivative. My differential equation deals with a double derivative. So taking another derivative, I'm taking the derivative, uh, these are constants, derivative of, derivative of sine is cosine. So, and derivative of the inside, another factor of omega comes out. So I get minus omega squared a cosine of omega t is the double time derivative of q of t. And this is where things look hopeful because this it was my um, q1 of t. So uh, compare this with my differential equation here. So, Comparing that, you get this answer. So this is a solution. So um, this is a solution if and only if that omega has a correct value. If and only if omega is equal to, or omega squared is equal to 1 over LC. 1 over LC, or Square, uh, omega is equal to square root of 1 over LC. The, is this uh, beginning to remind you of the oscillation um, topic that we covered at the end of Physics 4A? We did this like in week 12 or 13 of Physics 4A, or maybe week 14, I forget, right? So yeah, if this is reminding you of it, it should, because you know when we uh, did this demo, you saw something oscillate. So it should make intuitive physical sense that we are getting oscillating answer here. And we might even tell, uh, say this. We might even say this is the natural, um, natural oscillation frequency of LC circuit. Because with this demo, what you saw was that I had a uh, um, kind of a strike or a sudden shift in the circuit, and nothing was actually trying to drive the circuit at this frequency. But when you actually measure this period and try to calculate that frequency of oscillation that you saw, you will find that that's predicted by this formula here. Good. So, okay, let's uh, wrap up this discussion. Um, so, we found a solution. Um, since we had the second guess, let's finish it up and see if we have more than one solution. So, um, you know, take this, plug it in um, here. So we have to do, go through the exact same steps. Um, take this and take one derivative. So Q2 prime is, um, so derivative of sine, I get cosine, and then chain rule, derivative of the inside, factor of omega comes out. So omega b cosine of omega t. I need a double derivative. So taking derivative of this one more time, I get derivative of the cosine is minus a sine. Another factor of omega comes out. So minus omega squared b sine omega t. And like before, this is 
also Q2 of T. So yes, this is also a solution. And the condition that this omega has to satisfy, it's the same exact condition that was in the other um, solution. So um, I have two solutions. What should I do? Uh, uh, which of them is correct? They can both be correct. So this is some a concept that you would cover in um, in your math class. Um, I guess they call it general solution versus either specific or specific solution. So when you have a differential equation like this, there's a general solution. General solution is the solution that contains these kind of parameters that are um, that are analogous to um, integration constants. As in, these are undetermined by the equation itself. Omega is defined, determined by the equation itself, but with each of these solutions, we get these parameters that's not determined by equation. What determines these is what we call initial conditions. So, uh, so let me use the language that you will see in your physics, sorry, math 3. F, 3F class. So the solution to this, these are the general solutions. So general solution before that um, the most general form of an um, expression Q of T that would satisfy this equation is this. It's essentially a sum of both of these. This is something that's covered under something called a linearity. If one is a solution to a linear ordinary differential equation and the other one is also, then their sum is also a solution. So um, general solution here is Q of t is equal to this thing, A cosine of omega t plus this thing. That's why I used the different letter here so that I can add them later without implying anything plus b sine of omega t. And I'll leave it to your own exercise that um, if you plug this into the differential equation, it is indeed a solution. Uh, you can do it on your own time. And so that's the general solution. Now, for this specific question that we are asking here, we have to put in initial conditions um, to get the specific solution. So what I'm saying here is to get to obtain the, I, I, I may be using the wrong term. I always get this term wrong. I'm saying specific solution. Mathematicians might use something different. Uh, to obtain, I'll just say specific solution. Or is it particular? Who here has taken, is it particular solution? OK, to obtain a particular solution. Particular solution. You have to put in the information that was given in your problem. It said the charge is equal to this at time equals zero. It said, so we need to plug in initial condition. In our problem, that would be charge at time equals zero is uh, uh, the amount of charge that was initially on the capacitor. So, um, all right, now, mm, I thought when you do that, um, you're still not done. But um, uh, well, let me try it and see if we are done or not. So uh, when, you, when we plug in this set of information, this is what we end up with. That, um, so at time equals 0. So let me write down what Q of time equals 0 is. A times cosine of omega times 0. What's the cosine of 0? 1, all right. So A plus B times sine of, what's sine of 0? Zero? 0, so ooh, B times 0. So all right, so this condition does give me that A is equal to my initial charge Q0. But um, do I know what the B is? Yeah, I don't. 
So actually, this initial condition that we figured out, um, or that was given, it, it, it fixes one of the two parameters that I get from my two independent solutions. So I actually need two, um, two initial conditions or two boundary conditions to actually fix my solution completely. Any ideas where else we might get that? So, yeah. Well, it, it's going to oscillate. So here, you know, it's oscillating down to zero, but that's only because there's some resistance there. If it's an ideal case, it'll oscillate forever. So at t equals infinity, charge is undefined. Um, this is a general feature, but you know, since none of you have, or many of you haven't, haven't taken differential equation yet, I'll just give it to you, and you'll see it in your math class. For the second order differential equation, the way to specify initial a complete set of initial condition is the initial condition for your um, the parameter and initial condition for the derivative of that parameter. So what's the derivative of Q? That's uh, the current here, right? So if we know the current at initial time, that will give us the complete set of initial conditions. And yes, so we do know the current at time equals zero. So plug that in. So um, current I, or that would be dQ dt. Um, I'm, since I'm going to set it equal to zero, I'm not going to worry about the signs. Um, actually, no, sorry, I do need to worry about the signs. So minus, um, minus dQ dt. Um, well, that's equal to, let's just take the derivative of this in our head. That's uh, minus omega a sine of omega t plus omega b cosine of omega t. Um, we are evaluating all of this at time equals zero. So sine of zero is zero. So, um, so a actu uh, this term actually goes away. So this gives you um, the saying that all of this is equal to zero at time equals zero. That gives you no information about a, but that's fine. I knew that already. And the second information is here. So at time equals zero, cosine of omega t is one. So, oh, so I guess b is equal to zero. <laughs> it's going through a lot of steps to figure out that b is equal to zero, which many of you might have guessed already. Oh. So this is the solution step that we go through to solve this uh, second order differential equation. Um, so what we are essentially doing here is we are so, uh, turning this problem into differentiation and algebra problem by saying that, okay, we give up, we don't, we don't know a systematic way to solve for it, we are simply going to guess and check. We do make an educated guess, we have made this educated guess, and once you have done that, once you have found the general solution by guessing, then finding the particular solution is an exercise in algebra. Just plug in the, uh, the, you know, the, the snapshots that are given to you, that gives you, all right, A is equal to that, and B is equal to that. So for this particular case, this is our particular solution. That, so our particular solution is Q as a function of time is equal to, A is equal to Q naught, and that was cosine omega t. And this is the solution to this differential equation, which um, you might remember as if you are trying to look up what should cover the physics for A, this was actually called equation of motion. And what we are working with right now is the circuit analogy of equation of motion. Um, so that satisfies this equation of motion while at the same time satisfying these initial conditions. Q of t equals zero is Q naught and current is zero at time equals zero. So that's it. This is the LC circuit. This is the full solution. And um, um, what I'll tell you is that this whole thing about guessing the answer, 
Um, this is what we physicists to do. Uh, so, you know, it, I made it sound like we are only guessing right now because um, you guys haven't taken enough math. And what I will fess up right now is I've been a physics graduate student. I've actually majored in math. I've taken all the upper division math classes that you might ever take. Even then, in a lot of physics questions, we, uh, our favorite method of solving differential equation is guessing a convenient answer that we happen to know is an actual solution. Um, and you, um, even in physics graduate school, uh, you would very seldom actually apply the full rigorous set of mathematical tools to do this in the way a mathematician might. I mean, there will be some questions where you do that, but vast majority of the problems, you, you will recognize the form of the differential equation, so you will know the solution that you have seen elsewhere. So you'll be able to guess it. The important step that you have to do is you have to check it. So guessing is, you know, guessing sounds very uh, non-rigorous. It doesn't sound like something you do in your science and math classes. That's correct. You don't, if you stop with a guess, you're not doing it properly. You have to check your guess. And in fact, in the process of checking your guess is where you get this little nugget of information that you didn't know before, that the natural oscillation frequency is given by your component values. You will see this in your lab. 